Oak School in Tennessee, where Rosa Parks trained. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we return to our conversation with historian Jean Thea Harris, author of the book The Rebellious Life of Mr. Rosa Parks, I asked her about the fateful day, December 1st, 1955, in Montgomery, Alabama, when Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to obey a white bus driver, James Blake, who ordered her to give up her seat to a white passenger. I asked how long Rosa Parks was detained and what she did next. She's held there about three or four hours. Um, she calls home, and her mother is terrified. Have you been beaten? She says no. And so her husband starts to get money together to, to come get her. Meanwhile, someone on the bus goes to tell Edie Nixon. And Edie Nixon calls, can't find out any information, and then calls a white civil rights kind of couple in town by the name of Virginia and Clifford Durr, and gets Clifford Durr, who's also a lawyer, to call and find out what's happened to her. So both Raymond Parks and Nixon and the Durs all come to down and, and bail her out. And they all go back to the Parks' apartment. And the Durs are white, the famous Durs, civil famous rights white activists. Activists, leftists. Um, so they all go back to the Parks' apartment that night to talk about what happens next. Because Nixon, once he knows that she's okay, is in, in a measure delighted because he, she's exactly the kind of person that is both respected in the community. She's middle aged. She's forty two. She's super tough, right? So he knows he trusts that she's not going to flinch under the kind of pressure that's going to be brought to bear. And so he really wants her to be a test case. Um, and at first, her husband is very nervous, both for her safety and their safety but also because people hadn't necessarily stayed together around other cases. So he's worried, but they decide that she is going to go forward with this case. So she calls a young lawyer and friend of hers, a black lawyer by the name of Fred Gray, to ask him to, ha to represent her. And Fred Gray calls uh, Joanne Robinson, who's the head of the Women's Political Council, a professor at Alabama State. And the Women's Political Council had been very active around these issues. and. Joanne Robinson mobilizes that night, and they decide to call for a one-day boycott on the Monday when Parks is going to be arraigned in court. And so Robinson actually sneaks into Alabama State College in the middle of the night with two students and runs off 35,000 leaflets in the middle of the night. At about 3 a.m., she calls Edie Nixon, this is Robinson, and says, this is what we're planning. And so at 5 in the morning, Nixon starts to call some of the ministers in town to get them on board for this one-day plan. Um, and it is not till midday, when Rosa Parks, as she often does, takes her lunch to Fred Gray's law office, that she finds out sort of what's happening. Um, and so they are planning again for a, just a one-day boycott at this point on the Monday. Um, and people are very worried. Will people do it? Will people stick together? And then Monday comes, and it is this amazing people stay off the bus. She describes it as sort of the best moment of the whole thing. And, and that night, at a mass meeting at Holt Street Baptist Church, people decide to carry on the boycott, sort of, it, and make it a, you know, a longer boycott. And they choose a young minister who's just come into town to be their leader. Yes. Dr. And Martin Luther King. They choose him for a number of reasons. In part, he's young. He's new. He's not—he doesn't have any— He's not firmly aligned with one side or the other. His church is actually located right across—it's downtown, it's right across from the Capitol. So they have the first meeting—the ministers have the first meeting at his church on Edie Nixon's sort of idea, in part because it's so centrally located, and again, because Nixon sees that King doesn't have enemies in town. Um, and then it is at Holt Street where we get the first taste of sort of Martin Luther King's sort of you know, kind of political and oratorical brilliance, right? Because the speech he gives that night is an incredible speech. December 5th, 1955. Exactly. So Rosa Parks helped to la helps to launch Dr. Martin Luther King. Yes, she does. Yes, she does. Um, and in many ways, she... There's this interesting moment. So on Monday, right, she goes to court. She's very quickly convicted. Um, and then she goes back with Fred Gray to his law office. Um, she doesn't go back to work. She doesn't go home. She goes to his office, and she answers— She worked at Woolworths? Uh, sorry. She worked at Montgomery Fair. She she's an assistant tailor. Montgomery Fair is the biggest department store in Montgomery at that point. So she's, she's working in the men's shop. But she doesn't go back to work. 
and she answers phones in Fred Gray's office that Monday, and she doesn't tell people it's her, right? So this is sort of the paradox of how she negotiates this role. So she's she wants to be useful, so she's answering all these calls. People are wanting to know what's happening, what they should do. She's not saying it's her. And then, meanwhile, she stays and answers phones while Fred Gray and Nixon and King have a meeting where the Montgomery Improvement Association will be born, right? So in some sense, she— um, she's sort of doing the, this kind of behind-the-scenes work while the kind of leadership is being formed on that Monday afternoon. You talked about December 55, mm -hmm. coming just a few months after the murder of Emmett Till in Money, Mississippi, 14-year-old right. African-American boy, um, seared into the history and consciousness of this country, what happened to him. Describe what happened and how Rosa Parks was affected by it. The lynching of Emmett Till happens in August of 1955. But just days before she makes her stand, they've had this mass meeting. So part of what happens is the two men, because of the attention to the lynching, the two men are actually put on trial, which is sort of a rarity. But they are acquitted. Uh, this is Bryant and Millen. And so a campaign comes up to kind of raise awareness around this, um, sort of organized in part by um, Mamie Till, uh, his mother, and T.M. Howard. And so they've had—T.M. Howard comes to Montgomery just days before, and they've had this big mass meeting. And so it's very much on her mind. When she talks about sitting there in those moments, um, she talks about thinking about her grandfather. She talks about thinking about Emmett Till. Um, and she's, and when she's, had he come into town in Montgomery? Um, Howard comes in, I think it's just literally four or five days. They've had this big mass meeting. Four or five days. Before her arrest. So, so at the end of November, exactly. right after Thanksgiving. Exactly. And so it's really fresh, right? And the organizing is really fresh, right? So the lynching itself happened in August. But the, the kind of movement to sort of raise awareness and is is happening and has come to Montgomery just days before her bus stand. Um, and so she's very much thinking about that. And the bus driver says, you know, you all should make it light on yourself and, and get up. And she thinks to herself, this is not making it light on us as a people. And she's thinking about Till, and she's thinking about this kind of longer history, you know, and the Klan coming to her grandparents' house, you know, and sort of coming by. and. And so it's very much kind of how she's—you know, it's with her that day. The Klan came to her grandparents' house? And her grandfather would sit out at night, often with a gun, to protect the house. And she would sometimes sit with him. Um, after World War I, um, there's this sort of backlash partly against black service during World War I, and there's all of this kind of this uptake in violence in 1919. And so that also comes to Pine Level, to Alabama, where she grows up. And so she very much talks about remembering her grandfather sitting out on the porch with the gun, again, ready for sort of the Klan if they come. We're talking to Jean Thea Harris, author of The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. When Rosa Parks died mm -hmm. in 2005, mm -hmm. there was a huge memorial service for her in Washington, D.C. She was the first African-American woman to lay in state in the Capitol Rotunda, then her body brought to a church before the big uh, funeral in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And I remember the networks talking about Rosa Parks. I mean, there's no question it was a big moment, and the media took mm -hmm. notice. I remember CNN saying uh, Rosa Parks was a tired seamstress. Right. She was no troublemaker. But Rosa Parks, as you point out, was a first-class troublemaker. Right. So how did the image of her change? What did people understand at the time in 1955? I mean, I think we're, there's sort of two different things at work. Um, certainly, during the boycott itself, they background Rosa Parks' his political history for the safety of the movement, right? Immediately, I mean, this you mean is— mean they put it on the back burner? And they, and they play it down, right? They tend to talk about her as a good Christian woman. They tend to talk about her—and this is King, this is the black press, this is even Parks herself, right? Um, they don't tend to foreground her political history. Uh, in part because civil rights protests, this is 1955, are getting, you know, this is the Cold War. They're immediately red baited. All sorts of crazy rumors come up about her. 
she's a communist plant, she's an NAACP plant, she's Mexican, she has a car, she's not even black. I mean, just all manner of rumors in Montgomery Spring Up. And so, in part, to counter the idea that these are outside agitators, outside forces coming to, you know, coming to Montgomery, there is a tendency to talk about her, right, just as a kind of local woman, seamstress, Christian, right? So that obviously then, in the decades afterwards, takes on a life of its own um, in terms of her political history. The other thing I think that contributes to this is Rosa Parks leaves Montgomery in 57 and spends the second half of her political life in Detroit, sort of fighting the racism of the Jim Crow North. And so, in many ways, she leaves the South as this movement that she's helped to galvanize sort of takes on. And she has this new place in which she's sort of struggling in and, and part of a movement and that is not getting the same kind of attention. But fast forward, I think t by the 90s, right, and 2000s, right, um, in many ways in the wake of the establishment of the King holiday, we see the civil rights, the history of the civil rights movement begin to get kind of reshaped and twisted into this very happy, limited story of a this American movement that rises up and changes America, and then we vanquished racism, and there's this dreamy Martin Luther King and this quiet Rosa Parks are sort of the two people we get in that narrative. And that's a very happy story, and it, it makes us feel good about ourselves as a nation. And, and that story, I think, is part of what is at the center of the kind of national spectacle made of her passing. Who was Rosa Parks' hero? Rosa Parks' hero, um, she describes as Malcolm X. Um, she very much, she loved, she admired, she had, I mean, she had tremendous admiration for King, but she describes Malcolm X as her personal hero. Um, Rosa Parks was a lifelong believer in self-defense. Um, obviously, she gets that from her grandfather. In many ways, Malcolm X reminds her of her grandfather. Um, Malcolm X's willingness to sort of talk about sort of northern liberalism and northern hypocrisy, um, Malcolm X's very early opposition to the war in Vietnam, all of these things are very similar to her sort of political outlook, and therefore I think she very much looks to That's him. interesting, talking about Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, you write about Rosa Parks as an internationalist. Right, right. I mean, she is a very early opponent of the war in Vietnam. Um, as is John Conyers, um, and she, she, in many ways, she she comes to volunteer on John Conyers' very first campaign, right, for this new congressional— Long-time Congress member, dean of the Congressional Black Caucus. Right. And he runs for the very first time. Michigan gets a new congressional seat in 1964 that looks like it's going to, like, perhaps elect a second African-American to Congress from Michigan. And this young civil rights lawyer— right, is running on this platform of jobs, peace and justice, right? So he's running on a kind of anti-Vietnam platform in 64. Rosa Parks, very attracted to this, volunteers on his campaign in 1964 um, and gets Martin Luther King to come to Detroit on behalf of Conyers, right? Basically prevails on King. King is staying out of doing this kind of political stuff. He doesn't. But he can't say no to her. And this is a very crowded primary. Eight people are running. Um, Conyers wins by less than 100 votes. And so one of the things that he thinks really contributes is King coming, and part of what gets King to come to, Mon to Detroit, excuse me, is, is Rosa Parks asking him. And so one of the first things uh, Conyers does is he hires Rosa Parks to work in his Detroit office. And he is very much in the forefront of kind of the opposition to Vietnam. And so, and she, and that's, both of them are sort of working on that and so um, she takes, she is part of the sort of, gen, like, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. She's uh, supportive of the Jeanette Rankin Brigade, of the winter soldier hearings that they, that are held in Detroit. The American soldiers who came back from Vietnam and talked about the atrocities right. they committed there. And those hearings um, are held in Detroit. And then John Conyers actually goes, you know, is, is sort of um, one of the voices to kind of make to bring those, bring the Winter Soldier hearings to sort of Congress. It's when John Kerry became famous as this soldier who's returned and goes to Congress and testifies against the Vietnam War. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so that happens in Detroit, and it happens in part um, 
through kind of Conyers, uh, you know, kind of work on the. Why didn't Rosa Parks run for Congress in 1964 when the second seat opened up in Detroit? She is not someone who seeks or wants that kind of public limelight. Um, she finds her fame sort of hard to bear. She is a sort of stalwart activist. She is a steadfast activist. Um, but Conyers talks about her speaking with her presence, that she went to tons of things. She did what she could do to support, you know, prisoner defense committees, to support the uh, move the anti-Vietnam, all sorts of movements, but she is not someone who likes to be in, in the in the front, in the limelight, in the way that running for Congress would have been. Historian Jean Thea Harris, author of the new book *The Rebellious Life of Rosa Parks*, professor of political science at Brooklyn College, has written extensively about the civil rights and Black Power movements. When we come back, we speak with Theo Harris about what happened after Rosa Parks was arrested and convicted in 1956, how she dealt with losing her job. This is Democracy Now. Back. Thanks so much for watching this report from Democracy Now, your daily independent global news hour. We don't accept advertising or corporate funding, but rather rely on donations from viewers viewers like you. Please make your contribution by visiting democracynow.org. We need your support today to keep bringing you this hard-hitting, in-depth reporting.